you guys. This is uh, Professor Kerwin. It is Tuesday, and I was re looking at the discussions on the Canvas site for this class about Lab 5, which has to do with parts of the skull. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to record a short video and, and um, hopefully clarify a little bit <laughs> with the lab manual once. Um, I taught two sections of this in person at Alley Valley College this morning. And I just was realizing there's a lot to remember. And it's hard to see some of the parts of the skull if you're looking at pictures. So I have my teaching skull here. I bought this on amazon.com last spring out of desperation uh, because I was thinking how in the heck heck am I going to teach a lab class without any about osteology without any bones so um, because what I had before I bought this skull on Amazon um, was something that shouldn't be used in a even a college level class on anatomy actually let me show it to you I'll go get it <laughs> it was pretty bad <laughs> all right here it is ready this is what I had to teach bones of the skull with last April. Yes, but does what you think it is. It's a tequila bottle. And impossible to show you my students where the form and magnum is because it's not very accurate anatomically. <laughs> so I had to upgrade and I got this plastic skull. Probably made it in China or somewhere else in Asia with a 3D printer and shipped over here and to overcharge Americans who don't have their own 3D printer. So, um, okay, so here I'm back again. So I'm gonna show the lab manual and it starts on page 53 in the sixth edition for my Pierce College students like you guys. Um, so it says getting to know the skull. So, five, so exercise 5.1 is you need to learn the directions, anatomical directions in the planes and I wrote in some of the planes here that you should know that for some inexplicable reason was didn't make it into the sixth edition, but you still were supposed to know it. So when um, one of you asked, what do I draw for the skulls? You draw that anatomical direction indicated in the lower row. And I actually give you the answer in the Canvas assignment. So if I share screens and we go to the Canvas assignment, hold on, let me find it. Mm -hmm. There we go. And so on the Canvas assignment, I um, got photographs of a human skull. I wish I got the human skull that had the mandible, the jaw, but I was, didn't think of that that far then. So the interior view, as you can see, is the front view. The lateral view is the side view. The posterior view is the back view. The inferior view is underneath. And the superior view is from the top. So these are views, but they're also a way to describe using anatomical language where things are placed relative to something else. For example, if I hold my teaching skull, which for this class, I can't remember, did I name her Frida or Ingrid? <laughs> Not that it matters, especially since it's a male skull. Um, if I put my hand over this skull's over the skull, my hand is superior to the skull. If I shift my hand under, underneath it, my hand, my left hand is inferior to the skull. So these are directional views, but also the placement of something in relation to something else. Um, so yeah, just draw those skulls on the Canvas assignment um, on that lab page. Now moving right along. Um, answer the questions. For example, one, when you are looking at a person's face, you are seeing the which view of their skull, <laughs> the front. So 
which one of these words is the front? That's right, interior. Um, the answers are also are all on lecture slides as well. So here's the lecture slides. And I go through about what bones are and cartilage. How many bones does an adult human have? 206, give or take one or two. How many bones does an infant have when they're born? About 300. Why do newborns have 300 bones? So much more than adults. Um, it's because they're born with some of their long bones in pieces. And as they get older, the long bones fuse together. And then the anatomical position for the whole skeleton is um, uh, with the palms out. So with the palms out, that was an important one. And then here are the anatomical directions. Superior means above something, inferior below something, medial middle, lateral side. Anterior is the front. For quadrupeds like bipedal apes, like chimpanzees and bonobos, or like cats and dogs, the front of their body is called the ventral. So if the animal spine is parallel to the ground from swimming like a fish or running on all four legs, then the front or their stomach is the ventral, V-E-N-T-R-A-L. Consequently, their back, instead of posterior, like our back of our body is called the posterior. If it's a quadruped, it's called the dorsal. Super easy to remember if you know what a dorsal fin is. Dorsal fin is that fin along the spine in the, in the middle of a fish or a shark's body or a, <laughs> a dolphin's body. Um, when you're talking about long bones, the side of the bone closest to the heart is, uh, is the proximal side. So I have my, and the cool thing is since we all have a body, we can kind of check things. So, so here is my upper arm and the bone in my upper arm is called a humerus. And where it articulates with my shoulder is called the proximal side and where it ends at my elbow is called the distal side. Think of the word proximity means close. Think of the word distant means far. Pretty easy. So, um, so moving light right along. So exercise 5.2 asks you to understand the parts of the skull. And at the bottom of page 55, in the top of page 56, there are four parts. The mandible is the lower jaw. The cranium is the skull minus the mandible. The neurocranium is the brain case and the splanchonocranium. Yeah, it's a real word. <laughs> Doesn't exactly roll off your tongue. <laughs> is the bony structure of the eyes, nose, and upper jaw. If you do a quick Google search on the splanchonocranium, you might find some, um, plastic surgeon websites or reconstructive surgery or maybe a medical school site. It's kind of cool. Um, so on page 56, uh, if you don't have the lab manual yet, you're going to get my really messy <laughs> uh, old page that I scanned for these online classes. Um, and your job is to write these different bones on the pictures of the skulls on 57 and 58. On 57 is the anterior view of the skull. And on 58, it shows the lateral view of the skull on the top and the inferior view on the skull in the bottom. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you these bones on my teaching skull. So the frontal bone is the bone of the forehead. I'm gonna go kind of fast, right? So this is in blue on my teaching skull. The sphenoid bone is a butterfly shaped bone that goes behind the eye orbits and comes out on either side at your temples. 
and on this skull, it's red. So it's hard to see all of it. You cannot see all of it at the lateral view of the skull. You can see all of it on the inferior view easily on my teaching skull because it's in red. You see that? So it's like a butterfly shape. Also, you can see this bone in my lecture slides saved as a PDF file. So one of the study questions asks you, what bones touch the sphenoid bone? And I have the answer to that question on a lecture slide. So six different types of bones touch the sphenoid bone. Um, the frontal bone, which is on my teaching skull is blue in my hands, the ethmoid bone, um, the occipital bone, and then the left and right temporal bones, the left and right parietal bones, and the left and right zygomatic bones. So which bones are those? I will show you uh, on my teaching skull. So there we go. So hmm. Actually, I think I'm just, I'm not going to share. I'm just going to hold this up to see it. So what I'm going to do is I have my hard copy of the manual and I'll go over each part on this skull. I think it's initially I thought, oh, you guys can watch the video by Dr. Pearson because he's a, uh, actually a trained forensic anthropologist. But I thought, you know, with my teaching skull and each bone is a different color, it's kind of easier to see. So I'll just quickly through it, go through this on my teaching skull. And then I'm going to go through the uh, questions at the end of the lab. All right. So frontal bone. Also, rule of thumb, if you ever take a lab class, always hold one of the skull replicas. You'll almost always be handling replicas, rarely real bones. Uh, at least at the 100 level classes, like in community college. Um, also never have anything in your hands. It's too easy to draw on, a, on these replicas. So even on my own stuff at home, I make a point not to have anything in my hands or you're gonna end up with a bone, bones like, um, like I'm looking at right now. So uh, my son was really, you know, went camping a lot. Um, and really into bones and outdoor stuff. And I was in grad school when he was little. And so his grandma gave him a skull of a mountain lion. So look at that, isn't that cool? And he drew on it. <laughs> not sure what that means. <laughs> I don't, may not mean anything. It's just kind of cool looking. <laughs> so skull, this is not a real skull, by the way. It is a replica and it has like little manufacturer. Uh, right there, <laughs> you kind of see it. <laughs> so, all right, so back to business here. Uh, the sphenoid bone, so you can see it here, it's a butterfly shaped bone. You can see it uh, easily in the inferior view of the skull, um, especially if it's a different color from the rest of the skull. Um, the occipital bone is the bone that's on the posterior and inferior side of the skull. It kind of wraps around from the back of the skull to underneath the skull. On my teaching skull, it's dark blue, so the occipital. The ethmoid bone is hard to find. So the ethmoid bone is inside the nasal cavity. And if you see here, it's at ridges of your sinuses and it's kind of a white, colored white in this. So that's looking on the interior, you know, up inferior anterior through the nasal cavity, the ethmoid bone. We only have one ethmoid bone. You can, can't really see it in this direction. So we'll just, there you go. So that's the ethmoid bone right there. Um, the mandible is the lower jaw. The vomer is also in the nasal cavity. And the vomer is a bone at the yeah, inferior, or the bottom of the nasal cavity, and it divides the nasal cavity in the left and right sides. Not these two things on each side, those are the inferior nasal concha, but the one in the middle, it's 
And it's easier to see if you flip the skull over. And there it is. That's the Vomer. And notice it looks like a little V at its posterior side of the bone. Vomer, V-E. V-O-M-E-R, vomer bone. So when vomer. So these bones are single bones. The other bones are in pairs. So there's a left and right of each. First is in, uh, lacrimals. So the lacrimals um, are right above the tear ducts on my teaching skull. They're yellow. And they are the bones of uh, where tears um, and there's a little cavity where the tears drain when your eyes tear up. Uh, I believe in Spanish, lagrima, lagrima means tears. So lacrimal bone is the bone where the tear ducts are. Duck is like a little drain, okay? Lacrimal, so you have a, and when you side the bones, you always side the bones to the skull you're looking at, not your right. So this is my right hand. This is the right side of the skull. This is the right lacrimal bone. This is the left lacrimal bone. Uh, the nasals. So the nasal bones are the bones of the bridge of the nose. So here's the right and here's the left nasal bone. Uh, the zygomatics. The zygomatics are these flaring arches. They're where your um, uh, muscles that allow you to chew go underneath. So these are the zygomatic, zygomatic arches. So, they, so I'm holding this skull by its zygomatic arches. So the right zygomatic and the left zygomatic. The maxillae are the two upper, man, uh, upper jaw bones. So here's the right maxilla and here's the left maxilla. So plural for maxilla is maxillae. Uh, so the rules for pluralizing words with Greek and Latin roots are different than words with native English roots. So maxillae with the E at the end of it is plural for maxilla. So this is the right maxilla. And this is the left maxilla you can see on the screen. And um, the maxilla hold the top row of teeth. The top row of teeth... Um, uh, erupt from the maxilla, maxillae. The parietals, that's the left and right parietal bones. They're located on the superior side of the skull toward the back of the skull behind the frontal bone. So this is the right parietal. I'm tapping with my hand and this is the left parietal. On my teaching skull, they're colored green, colored green. The temporals, the temporal bone is actually behind the temples. So if your temples are here, you're actually kind of touching your, that's a little sphenoid bone right there. So the temples are actually around your ears. And on my teaching skull, they're dark brown. So this is the left temporal bone and this is the right temporal bone. Then we have the inferior nasal conche. Conche is plural for concha. And the inferior nasal conche are kind of these conch shell shaped bones. They're almost like a mm, scimitar sword. Yeah, that's not, a, um, um, like a crescent. Yeah, like a crescent, like a croissant, <laughs> um, like a crescent shape. And they're on the uh, right and left inside the nasal cavity, inferior nasal conche. And then the palatines are the bones of the roof of your mouth toward the back of your mouth. So there's the right palatine and the left palatine. Isn't that wild? Did you realize you had so many little bones in your face? It's crazy. Crazy. All right. So around the middle of page 56, we have the sutures. Okay. Right here. So these are the sutures. And so I'm going to show you the location of the sutures on my teaching skull, if the teaching skull has it. So the first suture is the frontal or metopic suture, and it's not present in adult humans. Oh, let me share screens. So this is the frontal bone, and you see it's smooth. There is no line there. But in some primitive 
primates like lemurs, they still have a little line there in the metopic suture. In some other mammals, like here, let me hold up this mountain lion skull. Um, you see this has these nasal bones right and left, and then you can faintly see like a little suture there along its frontal bone. Okay. So no metopic suture on adult humans. Um, infants are born, uh, when an infant born, a human infant's born, it has a little metopic suture, but it quickly ossifies. And um, by the time they're about three, they should have a smooth frontal bone uh, for no typical development. The next suture is a coronal suture. Uh, this is what I think of the Statue of Liberty TRS suture. It's along the coronal plane. The coronal plane divides the body from the front to the back, the interior versus the posterior. So this is the coronal suture. I'm running my finger over it on the camera. And on my teaching skull, it divides the blue frontal bone from the green parietals. This is the coronal suture. The next suture is, let's see, lambdoidal. So lambda is a Greek, it's a letter in the Greek alphabet that looks like an upside down W. And yes, that is the lambdoidal suture, lambdoidal suture on the posterior side of the skull. And it looks like an upside down V. And it runs between the occipital bone, which is on the posterior side of the skull and wraps to underneath the skull or inferior side of the skull and the left, the right and left parietals. So that's the upside down V or lambdoid suture. The next suture is a pair of squamosal sutures that to, for me was the hardest one to memorize. So I made up kind of like a crazy image in my mind that the squamal suture, which by the way, um, is in between the temporal bones, which are brown on my teaching skull, I'm holding the camera. The squamal suture is like a big curve. And then it kind of ends at the lambdoidal suture that curves up. So in my mind, I pretend that a skull man is wearing earmuffs made out of little squirrels. And this is like the back of the squirrel when the squirrel's going like this. And he has this big, and the back goes, curves over and then goes up in a bushy tail. Squamosal suture. Why squirrels? Because the word squirrel begins with SQ worked for me. Um, and then the sagittal suture. So the last suture, the sagittal suture divides the skull in the along the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane was named after the Greek Titan uh, Sagittarius. And Sagittarius was a mighty Titan. Titans came before the gods. And then the gods came and then they made humans and they just messing with us ever since, right? And so Sagittarius had the body of a center of a human and the, the um, below the waist, the body of a horse. And he was a very fierce archer. And so when he would pull back his bow and shoot someone, uh, his arrows were so powerful that they would cut the whole body in half. Um, top to bottom. So the sagittal plane is the line, imaginary line that divides the right side of the skull to the left side of the skull or the right side of the body from the left side. And here's the sagittal suture. So I'm looking, showing you the posterior view of the skull, the back view of the skull, and you can see the sagittal suture runs from the landoidal suture along the superior side of the skull and ends at the coronal suture. So those are the sutures. Next on um, page 56 are the main features of the skull. Now there's a lot more features, but all you have to do is worry about these and label them 
on pages uh, 57 and 58. So the first feature that I'm going to talk about is the temporal line. The temporal line is, or a temporal depression, is this line right about where the kind of, it's kind of almost, you can vaguely see it here in the sun. And it's kind of like this bump that runs along the frontal bone above the squamous suture, about an, um, nah, maybe three centimeters above the squamous suture. My fingers are going, so this is a temporal line. So that's a feature along the frontal bone. Um, you have a right temporal line and a left temporal line. Then the supra orbital torus. So it's spelled S-U-P-R-A O-R-B-I-T-A-L torus. And it's named after the astrological sign Taurus, but that's spelled T-A-U-R-O-S, I think. Oof, I'm not a good speller. <laughs> but that's not important right now. What's important is you need to know where that thing is. So that thing is right here, your brow ridges. So underneath your eyebrows, your skull protrudes a little slightly, more so in men typically than women. And there are some regional differences. And these are the brow ridges. And the brow ridge is the scientific name as the supraorbital torus, supraorbital torus. So these ridges of bone superior to the eye orbits. The next thing is the mastoid process. The mastoid process is named, uh, mast is for the Greek word for breast. And honestly, I think these anatomists in you know, medieval Europe who were naming parts they had way too much time in their hand and they were lonely because they thought that looks like a breast. Really? So where is that thing located? That thing, that mastoid process is located on the temporal bone, just, you know, we hold this skull in the anatomical position called the Frankfurt plane, just inferior posterior to the ear hole. The ear hole that the scientific word for ear hold is um, external auditory meatus. So my finger is tapping on the right mastoid process. The word process means protuberance or bump. So um, medially, so medial means in the middle. So if I have the skull, I'm gonna show you the posterior side. Here is the left I'm tapping on it in the right mastoid process. If you go inward, medially, there's two little stick, stick things, bits of bone. These are called the styloid process, similar to the French word for pen or stylo, um, like a quill, it means a quill. Like the old fashioned pens were made out of bird quills, right? You might, have you ever heard of that? And they would cut one side, dip it into an ink well, and then write. So this is a styloid process or stilo like process so that I have I'm clicking on it with my fingernail and this is the mastoid process um, the ramus of the mandible the ramus of the mandible is kind of like that L bracket of the mandible that articulates um, with um, your skull <laughs> So when you connect the jaw to the skull, the ramus is like the hinge that goes up and articulates with the skull, like an L joint. Um, here I have my finger on the ramus of this mandible right now. Um, body of the mandible, and now I'm holding the body of the mandible with my hands. It's more of that kind of horizontal part of the mandible. Uh, and then the occipital condyles. So the occipital condyles are on either side on the anterior edge of a hole at the bottom of the skull called the foramen magnum. Foramen means hole, magnum means large. It's where we get the word in English, magnumus or magnificent. And so it's kind of hard to see here. 
Let's see. There we go. So there's these occipital condyles. They are important when you try to get or calculate the facial index because you need to see how much the face protrudes from the center of the skull. So you measure in millimeters the distance from the occipital condyles to the edge of the face. So it's hard to see in here, but there are two protuberances a right and left occipital condyle on the interior edge of the foramen magnum. Foramen magnum is that big hole that the vertebral column articulates with the inferior side of the skull. The mental eminence. Why don't they just call it a chin? I don't, know, I don't make up the rules. It, it's a protuberance on the medial interior side of the mandible, and that's the chin. Mental eminence. And I'm touching it with my finger mental evidence. Zygomatic arch. So the zygomatic arch is that arch of bone that makes like a handle on the left and right or lateral sides of the face. So here's the right zygomatic arch that I'm hitting with my index finger and here's the left zygomatic arch. The external auditory meatus or EAM is the ear hole. It is located in the temporal bone, which is brown on my teaching skull. And now I have my little finger there to show you the ear hole. And that's the left uh, external auditory meatus. And I'll rotate the skull. And this is the right external auditory meatus. It's just superior to the mastoid process. Okay, so it's just above the mastoid process. Uh, foramen magnum is that hole here, the base of the skull, where your um, spinal column connects to your skull, your brain. And then the mental foramen is uh, mental means chin, right? Or mandible, foramen means holes. And you're like, wait, there's holes in your chin? Yeah, there are. There's tiny holes on their mandible and this helps uh, circulate blood and oxygen and all those good stuff to keep these cells healthy and um, also decrease blood flow around your face. So, you know, if you get really cold, your face doesn't freeze off. <laughs> so here we go. There's a tiny little hole. Can you see that? There's a little right foramen magnum and a left foramen magnum. Alrighty. So that's the major bones, major sutures, and major features of the skull. Now, in exercise 5.3, I ask you to calculate the nasal index and the cranial index indices. And I give you the measurements to use in the Canvas assignment for this lab. So it's called osteometry of the skull. So instead of your skull's index, use the measurements below for my multicolored skull replica that I named for this class, Frida. So just use these member, uh, measurements to calculate the cephalic or, or in other words, cranial index, same thing. And I even give the index formula. It's the width of the head divided by, this forward slash means divided by, right there, divided by the length of the head. So I will demonstrate to you how to take these measurements. So if you ever take another bone class, you're like, we got to do the cranial indices. You can go, ooh, I took that online. So I have a digital spreading caliper. So remember spreading calipers from um, last week are to measure larger things like skulls and pelvi and stuff like that. Pelvi, plural pelvis. All right. so. We're gonna measure it at the widest point of the skull. And those points are called the Euron, E-U-Y-O-N, in millimeters. And measure it on my teaching skull, Frida. And then I have the millimeters. So you can't see that here. So 
So if we were in class, I would have you look, take the superior view of your skull, find the widest point and take your spreading calipers and measure it, the widest point, uron to uron, left uron to right uron. And so the urons is the widest point of the skull. And then I would have you take the measurement to the length of the skull. And that is from the length of the skull is measured at a point between um, in the middle of the supraorbital torus or the brow ridges, a slight protuberance of bone behind your eyebrows. Here at the glabella, all the way to the most distant part of the back of the skull called the epistocranium. Okay, and that would get the length and you just take Um, you just calculate the head width divided by the head length. You'll come out with a, a decimal number. Multiply that by 100 to make it a whole number. And then do that for the nose, and I give you the measurements for the nose on Canvas, too. Then on page 61, you need to answer the questions. Uh, the first question is, in general, what does the cephalic index tell us about a skull or any skull? So is the cephalic index, does it tell you how big a skull is? No. What does it tell you? It's a quantification of shape or it tells you the shape. So there you go. Uh, two says draw a brachycephalic skull and a dolicephalic skull. Do you remember what brachycephalic and dolicephalic are? If you forget, that's fine. Just go to the Canvas site for this class and look for the assignment for lab one. And I have pictures of three different dogs and they have different types of skulls at the bottom of Canvas assignment for lab one. And oh, no, I don't. <gasps> Maybe I have it on pages. Is it on the page, please? Yes. There we are. Okay, so my bad. It's not on the Canvas assignment. It's on the Canvas page that the assignment links to. So dolicephalic means narrow skull. And brachycephalic means a round skull. So basically for brachycephalic, draw a circle. <laughs> and so dolicephalic, draw an oval, that easy. Number three, it says draw and describe a lepterine, mezzarine, and platterine nasal opening. Um, you can refer to uh, your lab manual for that. And the reason why it's not on the teaching page, on the canvas page is because uh, we no longer take those membership measurements in the later versions of, of um, the lab manual. So it ends with, with uh, the sixth edition. So I'm using the seventh edition at LA Valley College and we don't, um, we're not doing that anymore. So here they are, here are the nasal categories. They are printed on page 60 with the cephalic categories too. Um, on page 60 of the sixth edition of the lab manual that we are using for this class. Exercise 5.4, um, some identification questions. So this is a test your knowledge of skull anatomy. So number one at the bottom of page 61, it asks what, or should say what, <laughs> what is the raised rounded areas just superior to the eye orbits? So I'm gonna hold the skull in the camera and you can see where my fingers are. Those are the brow ridges above the eye orbits called the supraorbital torus, the brow ridge. So the answer is supraorbital torus. Number two asks you to name the suture that joins the two parietal bones. So I'm gonna rotate the skull to the superior view and that is the sagittal suture. The sagittal suture joins the right and left parietal bones, sagittal suture. Number three, the skull articulates with the vertebral column by means of the 
foramen magnum. So that's that large hole, right? Magnum means large, foramen magnum on the inferior side of the skull. Now I'm gonna um, go um, answer question number four at the top of page 62. And it says the sphenoid bone touches what other bones in the skull? Only list those in this exercise. So the sphenoid bone, if you recall, is that butterfly shaped bone that is inside the skull behind the eyes and it comes to the surface of the skull um, just above the zygomatic arches, just uh, superior to the temporal bones. So what bones does this sphenoid bone touch? Well, we can look at the sphenoid bone where it is on the exterior of the skull and we can name the zygomatic bone in orange on the skull or apricot color, the frontal bone in light blue on the skull, the parietal bone, which is green on the skull, the temporal bone, which is brown on the skull. And then easier, harder to discern is the um, bone, the small bones of the nasal cavity. So the, it also touches the vomer, my fingers on that vomer bone, um, the ethmoid bone and the palatine, left and right palatine. So it touches a lot of bones of the skull. <laughs> Um, and if that went too fast, just refer to my lecture slides because I have a slide that I showed earlier in this lecture. Number six, in humans, this suture is present at birth, but is usually no longer visible in adulthood. And that would be that metopic suture, which is gone from this replica of an adult skull that, run, that divides uh, the frontal bone. Number seven, what is the formal name for the chin? Is it found... Uh, it is found on which bone of the skull? So remember the scientific word for chin, it's on the medial interior of the mandible, the mental eminence. So my fingers touching the mental eminence. And um, study question number one, what is the Frankfurt horizontal? The Frankfurt horizontal is the anatomical position of the skull. So it's how the skull is in life. And it's important because when you lay a skull on a table, it's not in the anatomical position. And people don't normally walk around with their chin up. <laughs> Some people do, but I don't know. Not normally. So the anatomical position of the skull is called the Frankfurt plane or Frankfurt horizontal. And a way to measure it is hold a skull up in your hands and the lower edge, the inferior edge of the eye orbit should be level with the external auditory meatus. So, so kind of like about there. So that is the Frankfurt horizontal. That's how the skull is uh, in life or close to it. Um, it's important to orientate the skull this way because it's based on this position that you can describe where the other bones are. And if this was a real life situation and you were dealing with a skeleton that maybe was got shot in the head, you would have to describe the entrance and exit wounds of the bullet. And it'd be from this position. So you could say the bullet hit the head uh, on the superior side of the frontal bone. So you know, okay, superior means above. So it's somewhere up here. What terms do anatomy, so study question number two, what terms do anatomists use to indicate the location of one feature with respect to another? And those were those anatomical directions that we went over way back in exercise 5.1. So, and here they are on page 54. So um, anterior, front, lateral sides, posterior back, superior top or above, inferior below or underneath. Ventral is anterior for quadrupeds and dorsal is posterior for quadrupeds. And I think that's everything and that's it. So that concludes this lecture. So I hope you found that helpful um, and um, there you go. Take care.